Hey guys, welcome to the very first podcast after hours presented by myinvestingclub.com. I am Val, better known as Mon Rock, and my partner here, Alex. What's up, guys? Alex. Uh, so this is going to be episode one of the podcast. We don't really know what's going to happen, but uh, Val's going to intro right now, so we'll get into it. Yep. So we are basically trying to dispel what it means to be a day trader. You see online all these guys, oh, they're flying private jets or doing all this stuff. So I want to create a podcast and I wanted to, it to be like a day in the life of a day trader. People always want to know what it feels like to be a day trader. Is it glamorous? Am I fucking popping bottles and models and all these parties every day? Money's raining out of the sky. It's so easy. I'm driving a Lambo. And so I just want to talk about everything about trading like the lifestyle, the real lifestyle of a day trader. I've been trading for, man, two decades now. I've seen all the ups and downs. I've been at the beginning of the online internet trading days. So I've seen all of the scams. I've seen all of the big money being made, big money being lost, all the scammers, all these guys. So, um, and so Alex and I decided to throw this podcast. We really don't know what to say. We're just gonna free form it. And then you have anything to say, Alex? Yeah. So, I mean, what we want to talk about is the first topic that we want to kind of bring on on the podcast is that Bao has been around for like 20 years trading. And for most people that don't know, Bao was one of the creators or he is the creator of the first free online chat room. So I think we're going to start with uh, how that all started about and how the evolution of this online trading chat room community has changed over time from, you know, being something that was, really unique and helpful to now moderators and members doing these <coughs> dumb schemes behind the, uh, behind the scenes. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So let me move some of these screens around because let me see. There we go. Now I can see my face on there. <laughs> Every, it seems like everybody's doing a podcast, every sort of person. So I talked to Alex today, early today. I was like, why don't we do a podcast? Alex was actually his idea. We wanted, because people, do not relate to these celebrities. People watching these podcasts or listening to these podcasts from celebrities, which they're totally different animals. They're like the Kardashians. It's like you watch for entertainment, but we want you guys to be entertained as well as being informed and to learn education, right? I've always been the type of person that likes to watch documentaries uh, as opposed to just fiction. So things that I read and and listen to are factual kind of things that I can learn from, right? So Alex puts a great point. Not many people has been doing this, meaning this as an online trading since the beginning of online trading. I was there fortunate enough to see the dot com. I may not look old, but I'm 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 pretty ancient. I'm Asian. I'm Asian guys, so <laughs> I, I have that good Asian. And I am actually day trading right now as we're doing the fucking podcast. So <laughs> this is what it means to be a day trader, guys. I live, I breathe day trading. It, for me, I made enough money where I do this because I love it. Of course, if it's not for money, I wouldn't be doing this, right? I'm not trading uh, paper trading just because I love trading. I love trading. But the reason I love trading is, well, of course, there's a reward system to it, right? And so... So that's, that's what happens when we went online. So the beginning of online trading started like this. When I used to trade, man, the commissions were so expensive. My God, I literally spent over six figures, which I still do, but I spent, I think, a quarter of a million dollars before in commissions. That's not including short selling locates. Back in the day, I, I could short anything I freaking wanted to, man. I, it was naked shorting. It was a wild, wild west. It was just fucking crazy. But nowadays, they created this locate thing where they're making money left and right of all this, right? So back in the day, I could have shorted anything I fucking wanted. Uh, it was that powerful where if you knew certain systems, so I don't know how much I want to expose. Is the statute of limitations over, Alex? What, what's the statute? <laughs> I don't know. Let me, let me talk to the lawyers next to me standing by. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, dude, I, could, I mean, it, it was a dawn of the new era, right? So with the dawn of anything, there was a lot of seedy characters trying to manipulate the system, trying to screw everybody. And here comes 
bulletin boards have always been around guys. Um, bulletin boards mean like a chat room. So before there were visual chat rooms, like today they're visual, right? You can type and you see. Basically all you see are people's names and what they type. It's called MIRC, IRC, Internet Relay Communication, whatever it's called. Um, chat or whatever i don't know the, the exact acronym name but it's irc and it was basically a bulletin board system so we would log in and i was the member of i was not the pioneer there were other chat rooms way before us but i made it popular by creating by being myself so I, I, i'm trying to figure out how you do it so the beginning was this so when i started training there was a big big community called stock gappers and so this is where I learned a lot of my penny stock, like just like just the ideas of gapping, the ideas of these stocks just running to crazy levels. And so then I created my own called small cap, small cap room, small cap traders. It grew to like a few hundred people. It was literally wild, wild west. Wait, let me cover. I see. <laughs> <laughs> He's made a few hundred bucks. <laughs> Pay for it. It pays for this webcam. <laughs> um, but, um, so, okay, I'm just gonna get to the dirt of it, dude. It, it was, I created for a reason. The reason I created really because I was bored, guys. I was fucking bored out of my fucking mind. I, I didn't have any friends trading. I was stuck in a little room by myself. And why not create a community of people to trade? And so I created with the right mindset with, shit, let me cover this over. <laughs> Still not out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I created with the right idea of helping people. But it started to balloon. I, then I realized, oh my God, dude, because I'm not a scammer, guys. I've never, this is the type of guy I am, right? When I'm playing poker, I, I can see other people's cards next to me. I am the guy that tells them, yo, I can see your cards. I don't want to look at their cards. So I'm telling them, because I want to win the right way. I don't want to win by cheating. I, I'm the sort of guy that would tell you, yo, man, hide your fucking cards. Everybody can see the cards. And that's the kind of person I am. Uh, when you're young, you're like, shit, man, nice guys finish last stuff. But I truly believe karma handles everything. And so the reason why I am where I am today, because of the integrity, the honesty, and all this stuff, right? And so I created a chat room because I was lonely. I wanted to help people learn to trade and all that stuff. And it helped me too. I was still a beginner back then. You know, I'm still a beginner today. I'm, I'm looking 20 years ago. I'm like, oh my God, dude, there's so much I didn't know back then. There's still so much more I didn't know today. The more you know, the, the more questions you have. And that's, that's the thing. So, and then a lot, everything in the beginning, just like Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin was used to, to buy drugs through Silk Road back then. Now they're using it for, for the first, so anything, the internet, the beginning of the internet was used for porn. So every, everything in the beginning is always used for nefarious activities, right? Uh, so same thing with chat rooms. And so what, what they did was they, they have, so, should I just fucking say it, Alex? <laughs> yeah, you can say it, bro. Say it, but be careful, you know? All right, so I'm just drinking beer. It'll give me a little liquid courage to tell you what's fuck, how these chat rooms operate, okay? <laughs> careful, bro, careful. <laughs> so what happens is this, man. I didn't know about this. So there would be the guy that creates a room. He picks his moderators, and the moderators are usually his friends. And so what they used to do is this, which they still do today. They find a bunch of low float stocks, cheap stocks they buy it they secretly accumulate the shit they tell all the fucking moderators which is their in group so there's a sequence of guys that they tell they tell the, the the guys that don't buy much in the beginning but the guy but more of their friends and then they wait for the big guy like me so i never was involved in any of this shit right i but back then i'll tell you what i was involved in what i wasn't um so they would buy secret shit and then pump it to their members. And I mean, it's just so bad. But that was the norm back then. It was wait, the wait, fucking you're saying, norm. You're saying that these chat room owners, these creators, these gurus were buying small cap garbage, telling their friends about it, AKA the moderators, and then having the moderators pump it to the chat room members who are paying them to learn. Yep. That's yep. fucking insane. And even, even but back then, remember, it wasn't paid. It was free, and they had thousands of members, 500 members. Wow. And they made, so they, you can make money off two ways, right? You can charge your members. And by charge your member, at least you get a fee, right? Or give it, give it away for free. Give the service away for free, but use the people as sheep. Make sense? So they're making their money on the back side, the back end, by pumping these to their members. Wow. 
And of course they will never lose because they got in first, you see? And so you got these guys that never fucking lose. So they would post shit on message boards like Investors Hub and all that stuff. Um, and they're like, wow. But, they, but people don't realize they start to pump themselves. Now how legal it is is not, I, is, I mean, I'm not the judge through that. In, I admit, I've seen it and I'm not the guy that participates, but I, I track them early, so I get them early. So this is how this is how honest I am, guys, which fucking sucks at that time. Because I'm like, man, I was so pissed off these people were making money that I didn't fucking participate. But there's a reason why karma fucking helped me, okay? So I was one of the biggest bulletin board traders back then, pink sheets. And so if I had mentioned any fucking stock, that stock would fucking spike up. So I didn't realize that over time. I realized that. And then the way I prevented that from happening, guys, oh shit, Xnet is tanking. <clears throat> but it's still 551. But yeah, still room, still room. The, 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 the moment I, maybe we, the next time we do this podcast after after hours. <laughs> yeah, maybe we actually do it in after hours. Or maybe, maybe this is a reason for you not to be trading, bro. <laughs> I know, man. This is, this is why I need to get away and take a beer. But anyways, so what are we talking about? So yeah, I, 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 I realized that, dude, there's certain people that can move a stock. And I was one of them. And, and to prevent that, what I used to do is I used to put my list at the close. So when the market closes, then I put out my list. And so which is the same way that we do at MIC now. I, I show my trades after I get out. So that it doesn't influence you, it doesn't influence the stock. Make sense? But there are people that cannot trade. So if you take a look at... It's very simple to figure out if someone's a real trader or not, okay? Why are they posting? Are they posting to help people or are they posting to pump their own playbook? So you have to take a look at all the shit they're posting. And when are they posting? They say, oh, I accumulated this shit yesterday. I accumulated this shit on fucking Sunday. Um, fuck it. I mean, fucking Sunday's on the market in the open, right? But, <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? It's like, are they giving this shit in real time or are they only pumping it at the resistance. So there is a whole trick to how people are pumping shit. They, they buy the shit, they alert it to their members or their close friends, and it moves up the stock. But then the stock will hit a resistance, right? And it'll stop. And that's when they tweet it to the public. The public will then break that resistance so that they can fucking get it higher. You see, there, there's a different level of fucking, they have their own pumping process. Just like we have a process for shorting stocks and trading stocks, they have a process for pumping. And That's usually it, it fucking involves one guy who has the power, he accumulates it, but he has to get other people in. So it doesn't look like it's his fucking pump. Make sense? So he starts to move it out, out. And then the ending, the end game is when he tweets it or he puts it into a public bullion board like Investors uh, Hub. That place is a fucking cesspool of fucking pumpers, man. Fucking nothing but pumping them. So you take a look at these guys I tweet. I tweet. When I tweet, I tweet my trades after I'm done to educate people, right? That's a difference. I don't fucking pump my own playbook. If I was to alert a play, it should be real time. I use alert real time, by the way. But then I realized, man, it doesn't really help people because it artificially moves the stock up and down. And so if anybody, so this is a sign that you know that someone's a fucking scammer and a pumper. If they start tweeting plays that they fucking owned before and then, oh, I've been in this stock. I held this shit since last week, since yesterday. They're fucking pumping. Why are you tweeting this now? You're tweeting it so that you can pump it so you can get out of your play, right? So that's one way they do it. Back, back, I mean, those guys, most of them have been arrested by now because they, they get very greedy, but you know what, man, there's always guys, we, there's always new groups of guys pumping all the time. So, so the chat room was invented most of the time is to pump a stock. Okay. And, and you have two types of guys. You have a guy that's always fucking, uh, so don't, I mean, don't, that's the thing. The free ones are the worst in my opinion, the free discord rooms, they are full of pump and dump. And so, so there's a reason why we price what we price is to eliminate a lot of the pumps and dumps. Um, dude, there's so much more, but. <laughs> so that was, that, was, that was how it was back then, right? That was how it was back then. How is it adjusted to way, the way it is now? Because 
it seems like these days, the way they're doing it now is not only are they getting a subscription fee, they are also sending out, you know, text message alerts, uh, voice alerts, uh, screen share alerts, all this stuff. So it's kind of- There, there are two, there's many levels of complexity to trading and uh, pumping, right? Uh, you got guys like straight up, I bought this. Bye, 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 bye. I'll get you on the fucking microphone. Bye, bye, bye. That's the lowest form of pumping. That to me is like, those guys really don't know how to trade. They, they, they are the level, the low level fucking, low level pumpers. Okay. They get on their microphone. They tell all the guy, bye, bye, bye. And then they, the moment those guys buy, and this is how it works, guys. It's very simple. If you take a look, if you track it, how they fucking do this. They, they buy the, they know where they're going to buy. They buy the alert. They're already in. So the moment they alert to the members, the stock pumps, goes straight up. So they're, they got their finger on the sell button already. The moment it starts to slow down and they don't see a peak, they fucking sell. That's how they're always never fucking lose. They're in and out. The only time they lose is when they buy it and it doesn't go up and they themselves cost the tank because they sold themselves. The, that is the simple way of pumping. The master pumpers are this. The master pumpers fucking accumulate shit in private the day before. And they make it seem like they're fucking, so they are building the chart. They're using level twos. They are the ones that are bid propping. They're spoofing, okay? And you know, I've taught a lot of people how to spoof. So I know how to spoof back in the day. Spoofing means this. It's basically putting a fake order that you know you never fucking fill. So you put 100,000 shares bid and you show it, but you don't put, you're not the, the highest bid. You are like 10 cents below or five cents. And so you're ready to fucking cancel any fucking time it comes close. You're using that to spoof, to manipulate, to show fake interest. So you, you're building your level to yourself. That's why I said level two is a manipulation tool, guys. I can, I have a lot of routes back then. I could have fucking stacked and built my whole level two myself. You know, there's a lot of tricks of this shit. And so level two is a manipulation tool. If you see a guy putting 90,000 shares, oh shit. <laughs> I see he's going lower. <laughs> I know, I just took 172. I think I'm good. You sure you're good? <laughs> no, I, I covered down, down. So, um, but anyway, so you see how that, that works, Alex? So they built, so they, they pumped their members in, uh, they, they accumulated already, right? Uh, they accumulated. And then they, what they do is they, now they start to put bids in. So they're creating an artificial market for it. They are basically manipulating the stock. So it seems like there's artificial demand when it's just them and their group of people. So you always have to be fucking careful, okay? How are these guys getting so low? You would never know. They, they're in the day before already, dude. Um, so that is the more intelligent pumper. Intelligent pumper is a guy that accumulates and starts to build that stock chart themselves. They are fucking walking the stock up because it's low, right? Thin. And then what happens is they put in the bids. How many times have you seen the bids being being drawn, Alex, right? You see like 50,000 shares, 10,000 shares. It does not take many fucking size to move a stock nowadays if it's a thin stock. Yeah, it's true. It's true. That's just crazy how that's the shit they're doing behind the scenes. And I mean, we've been at this for so long. And I've been doing this for six years. You've been doing it for almost 20 years that we notice these things. But to the brand new trader, to the brand new investor, to the brand new person getting into the market, when they see, you know, all you have to do is follow this email. All you have to do is follow this text. What they don't realize is that without them buying the stocks, without them pushing the stocks higher, these gurus and furus and all of them have absolutely no opportunity to make money because realistically, they do not know how to trade. They only know how to pump their plays. Yep, yep. So they're using manipulation through uh, spoofing, which it's... Which uh, the algos do. You see all these big ass sizes never get hit. You know, it's like if you see, so, so think about this. If you really wanted to buy 100,000 shares, would you show 100,000 shares? No, you would fucking try to hide it and make, so if you wanted to buy 100,000 shares, what you do is you fucking, you know, you, you would fucking secretly hide and put show 500 shares and, and, and fucking keep refreshing when they hit you. You don't put 90,000 and 100,000. You put that so that you can push it up. You push it up so you can sell the stock. So when you see a giant bid like that, doesn't mean it will tank right away. It just means that some guy is trying to push the stock up artificially. So you just watch him walk it up. The moment that he sells out and you see all the selling being refreshed, 
right? And so he'll walk it up to the point where he sells all the stock. And, and it's like, damn, there's a big demand. And then when he sells out the stock, it fucking collapses. You see his bids just fucking disappear. Same thing on the offer. If you see 100,000 shares on the offer, he's, he is trying to manipulate the stock. He is either trying to sh cover the bid or to walk it down or something like that. But usually it, it's the opposite of what the intention is. Yeah, that's crazy, man. This fucking, it just, blo it's like, it's crazy because these things happen every single day. It happens no matter what, regardless. And it's not just one person doing it. It's 10, 20, 30 of these people doing it over and over again, trying to find the lowest volume garbage and pump it themselves. And then it's just crazy, man. It's crazy. And that's why at MIC, what we try to do to separate ourselves from that is we put out our game plan beforehand and we show our trades after the fact as an educational tool rather than just following someone. Because if you follow someone, what happens when A, me or Bao one day die and you can't follow us again? Or B, what happens when these pumps that these guys are doing, they eventually go to jail for that stuff. You know what I'm saying? So you have to learn the proper process of trading. So that's why we kind of created this podcast to educate the world on all the frauds and all the scams that are out there. If you, if you take a look at all the people that traded bulletin boards successfully for as long as I did, um, they either all get arrested or they all get arrested. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm clean and thank God that I'm clean and that's why I'm around because you know what, man, I, I'm the type of guy, like I said, man, if, if I don't even look at your fucking cards. If you show me the cards when you're playing poker with me, I don't want to look at it. And so that's, that's the, everyone's always trying to find like one up on one another. And that's the wrong way to fucking do life and to trade, man. You want to learn to trade properly, not to find some sort of fucking scammy loophole that you can make money. That'd be nice too. If you can find a loophole and manipulate it and make money and it's legal, do it. But, but that only goes so far in life, so far in trading. Um, and so the, the chat room, what, what the chat room does is, dude, it's fucking open a new realm of fucking scamming, man. And, so, and then, oh, fuck. These fucking chat rooms. So we're using Slack, Alex. What Slack is, it, Slack is a public chat room, right? So we can't manipulate the software. Oh, yeah, yeah. You These motherfuckers are writing software where they can read your private messages, bro. Yeah, imagine, all, imagine that. All these fucking chat rooms. All these fucking chat rooms. I'm not going to name any fucking names. All of them that write their own code has a back door. They can read your fucking private message. They have to because the SEC is going to come in and audit them. And they're going to go, show me your private messages. They have fucking no choice. But if you're running a Slack, public Slack, the guys like me and Alex cannot look into your private messages because we don't own it. But if I was the owner of, of fucking uh, my own chat service, I can fucking read your private messages because I, I, it's like having a backdoor to a poker website, guys. They can read your fucking messages, man. Imagine they can see your hold cards in poker. How many of those poker websites went down because some guy got the back end uh, door uh, key, right? And they're watching your hold cards. So same thing in fucking trading chat rooms, man. Don't fucking trust these chat rooms that have their own private fucking service. You are sending a private message. It's not fucking private. The fucking owner can read it. It's sketchy too because they don't disclose that stuff when you sign up. They, 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 why would they disclose it? Yeah. yeah and absolutely. you know what, man? I'm probably going to get a ton of grief from these guys that do it. But once again, I didn't name anybody. And so if you, if you see them pissed off, it's because they must do it. It's not my fucking fault. They'll stop doing it. So when we started MIC, I made sure that we use a public so that we don't have to have, we don't run into this fucking issue of anybody manipulating. And like, if we paid a, a guy to program our chat room, you don't think that guy can read a private message, put it, put his own back door in. That's very dangerous, right? So it's very good that we use Slack, man. Slack may not do everything we wanted to do, but at the same time, it gives the users a level of confidence, guys. So that's another thing too, man. You got to be careful about these fucking services that write their own fucking code, man. I'm not saying every one of them is reading your private messages, but I'm saying they can if they wanted to. doesn't mean they will, but, but you see what I'm saying? The, the, the fact that you, you have this option, it could fucking fall into the wrong hands, guys. Who knows what the developer is doing, dude? 
you know? So you gotta be careful. Private message is not fucking private. Okay. Just like anything else in life. Right. So, um, that's one thing you gotta work, uh, be, be on the lookout for. So let, let me talk about, um, something that's very interesting, man. I think the statute of limitations is over. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk about karma real quick, guys. Um, I have a lot of friends or when I say friends, I mean, people I know online. It doesn't mean I met them in person or anything. Right. That, um, uh, I started training a long time ago. So there was one really famous pump and dumper guy, which I didn't even know was a pump and dumper, right? So he became a very big, good creator. But then he started to look at promotions and he's like, holy fuck, why the fuck am I trading, making little money when I can just fucking run my own scam and make tens of millions? So he actually came up to me because I taught him how to trade in penny stocks. And he got told, so into the penny stocks, he goes, Bow, why don't we do a promotion together? I fucking keep, I can buy a company and I can fucking pump it. We can make mailers. We can do all this shit. And so I'm like, what the fuck? Right. And so I'm like, nah, dude, I'm not into that shit. So, so at that time I saw this guy do it. And then he ran one of the biggest promotions in the fucking world. I'm not going to name whoever it is. These, the stock made $50 million. He made him like 50 mil. He sold his stock and he made 50 million. And at that time, this was like, man, decades ago, right? When it was like wild, wild west. It was like, uh, so I'm like, holy fuck, why didn't I become, why didn't I work with him? You know? And then, so after he ran his first promotion, I never heard from him again because you're like, why? He doesn't fucking need me anymore. He needed me because I taught him how to trade properly. And so this guy was fucking dangerous because you know why? Not only was he a good trader, he was a fucking thief. <laughs> and so you imagine most of these scammers, they don't really know how to trade. So they're just the first level scammer right this guy was a good trader and he had tons of money and he was a fucking bad guy so he knew exactly where the lines were the support the resistance he knew exactly all this fucking shit and he controlled the stock so he made the stock fucking very natural looking was fucking like right on the money but i didn't know it was fucking a scam years later i would get FBI calls, which I still fucking do from time to time because of, of that past. I've never been fucking arrested about that shit. They always ask me, the one question they always ask me is this, why are you in every single one of those stocks? I'm like, why the fuck not? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like I figured out the, the system. So, you know, here, here's some fucking funny ass SEC stories, man. I traded every fucking bulletin board because that's what I did. I found a niche. People made fun of me. I had friends that were trading big cap stocks, IBM, Apple back then, right? And they're like laughing at me because I'm trading like 30 cent stocks, 50 cent, $2 cent stock. They're laughing at me. But then at the end of the year, I always made a lot more money than them. Knock on wood. Because I figured out the scam. The scam was they pump it up and they take it down. And I created a three-day rule out of that because they, they use those type of uh, technical analysis stuff and, you know, to, to, to a fucking thing. They pump it up, they fucking triples, quadruples in fucking three days. It parabolics up and then fucking dies. It's the same fucking pattern over and over back then, right? And so, so I would trade them all. And so I would be sitting on, uh, funny stories, I would be sitting on fucking toilet. Dude. I was literally on the fucking toilet and they had a call from the SEC. Sir, excuse me, why did you trade so much of this stock? GM, GM, Q. GM, GM, Q. You traded 10% of the entire volume that day. Why? Are you running that stock? And literally, I go, hey, thank you, ma'am. Um, you know what that stock is? That stock is General Motors. <laughs> General Motors went bankrupt that year. And so he, so General Motors was a listed stock on New York Stock Exchange. And then it, it moved over to um, the, the bulletin board, the pink sheets. And so they renamed it GM, GMQ. And like, do you realize this is fucking General Motors? It's a billion dollar company. And you, and I'm literally sitting on the fucking toilet. I told her that. I'm sitting on the fucking toilet right now. And you're, and I go, thank you. For, get, uh, for, 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 for thinking that I could run a fucking scam <laughs> such as big as a General Motors scam. And then this one, I realized that SEC guys don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Sorry, guys, if you fucking read this. I'm no offense to guys. But so that chick, you know what chick told me? Oh, my God. I know. I know you're not the guy running it. But I have. But my boss told me I had to call you because you're on the fucking list all the time. <laughs> and you go, off the record, how the fuck do you do it? How do you do it? Off the record, can you fucking show me how you fucking do <laughs> so it? Wait, wait, wait. The SEC person off the record, want to learn how to trade. <laughs> dude, seriously, dude. I, not on one, not, not just one occasion, multiple occasions. They have fucking told me, holy fuck, how the fuck do you do it? And I keep telling you, this is a scam. 
The moment I see the fucking stock move, I load the fuck out of it on day one. I sell it on day three. As simple as fucking that. And so I was literally 10% of most of these volumes because I'm trading in and out of the fucking stock. I, you know what I'm saying? All fucking day. It, it was that fucking lucrative back then. Um, dude, man, it, it was so insane back then, guys. It, it, it was just... Wild Wild West, we didn't fucking know anything, but I knew a little bit about technical analysis. I knew a little bit about their fucking scam. So the SEC has me on fucking redial, guys. And uh, I, I never rat. That's the one thing I do, right? I mean, I know so much fucking dirt and... Oh, shit. <laughs> well, what happened? Oh, that's one of the Fugu websites I follow. Let me, let me turn that up. So another strategy that I like to trade, guys, is I, I like to – I like I, a big part of my income is trading against pumpers. There's always room for all sorts of types of people, right? So I, I hated pumpers. I never wanted to be a pumper. But I'm like, why not fucking take advantage of the pumpers? Yeah, and these are setups that we talk about in MIC as well. So we won't get into too much details about that. But yep. I mean, there's always ways to make money. If someone is doing something wrong, there's always ways to profit on the opposite side of that trade. So that's crazy, man. That's a crazy story. Yeah, so this is what I realized, dude. That, so, they, so I actually hired um, an ex-SAC as my lawyer. He was on TB, uh, TV. Cheers, guys. He was on CNBC. I see him all the time. I fucking decided to hire him. I was like, fuck why not fucking hire the best, right? I did, so I literally did this. I basically, he told me this. He told me they don't know shit. Is the guys coming out of college, they use the SEC and they work for that as a resume builder so that they can enter private companies like Goldman Sachs or whatever the fuck it is, right? Going to private practice, right? And so, it's, so that's why they don't understand how a pump works. And it's actually not in their best interest to stop these fucking pumpers. They, that's why they only attack these small companies and they arrest these small guys. This scam happens on the biggest fucking platform in the fucking world, large cap stocks. Guys doing upgrades, downgrades. Come on, man, fucking. These targets are so insane. You think these think these stocks ever reach anybody's target? There might be one out of a hundred stocks, right, Alex, that reaches anybody's fucking target. If any, if any, one out of a thousand, maybe. So that's that's the fucking scam. The scam is still going on, okay? But it's legal because they created the rules to help them. So what they do is this, man. They put a big ass price target. A stock is trading at two dollars. They put a twelve dollar price target. In the meantime, they have an ATM, a shelf, an offering, well, you name it. They just dilute that shit. And they're fucking selling all the way up. And they're like, hey, as long as I disclose, it's legal, right? As long as I'm telling you that I'm scamming. I am scamming this stock. I am putting a price target at 12 because the stock is at two and I need to get rid of shares so that I can raise cash for this piece of shit company. But it's legal because I disclosed everything. The reason why these scammers back in the day got busted because they didn't disclose. I'm thinking, Are you stupid, just fucking disclose. If you just disclose, you had fucking two million shares that you can flip. You put that in the smallest print. That's what they do. All these companies, the, the legal scams, they have these pages and pages of disclosures. And that one fucking line down the, in the fucking middle or the bottom, there's like, we own two million shares. <laughs> right? And that's how they're getting away with it, man. The scams are still happening. This is why I trade small caps. The reason I trade small caps is this, because I know the end game. If you know the fucking end game, you know it's a scam. You know it's going to go up, it's going to go down. But a stock like Apple, you don't fucking know. It's a real company, dude. And the real companies have their own different kind of scam, okay? It's like the, the funds hold most of it. 80% is all funds. So you can't, you know, the, the big money moves that shit. So, the, the, so that's why I, I, we, I trade small caps. I don't trade small caps because it's, it's cheap. That's not the fucking reason why is, you know, I trace small cast because it moves a lot and I know the end game. If you know the fucking end game, it's a matter of patience and timing. Trading is all about timing, right? And so, so small cast is great, but if, if you have bad timing and you will go broke. So it's okay if you trade large cast. I'm not bashing anybody large cast, small cast, but I'm just trying to let you know that the same games happen over and over. No one talks about it. 
because it's not in their best interest to fucking do it. The stock market is the, the, the economic engine of America. It's the symbol of capitalism. And I'm telling you right now, dude, you play by the rules. Stop fighting the fucking rules. The moment I became rich was I realized every fucking stock is a scam, man. You just have to fucking play in their own paradigm of the scam, right? Scam is relative in my opinion. There's a lot of things which are legal, which in my opinion is a scam. So is it legally scam or if it's like, um, what the, like, like, a, like, like, like mentally a scam or is it like really criminal scam, right? Um, putting a price target of 12 when a stock is at two, knowing very damn well that you have 2 million shares to dump, to me is a fucking scam. It may be legal, but it's still a scam. But if you know that in mind, I love it. I don't want any of these scams to go away. That's how we make money, man. We, they run these stocks up so that they can raise funds for these piece of shit companies, right? It's like, that's why I trade stocks under five bucks. Stocks under five bucks, most of these funds are not in it. They're not fucking margin. They can't fucking hold these. That There's rules of regulation hold these fucking pieces of shit. But at the same time, they will blow you away if you fucking think you're going to short early. Um, knowing the end game helps us significantly. Okay? Knowing the fucking end game helps us. With a stock like Apple, fuck, man. I ha what the fuck chance I have? They have analysts in there figure out exactly how many iPhone orders were fucking built in China. They got guys sitting in China fucking counting that shit. Counting how many trucks are coming out from factories, right? Things like that. It's so fucking crazy, dude. They, they used to have consulting firms that, uh, I don't know, it's still legal, but it was on the news. CBS had fucking 60 Minutes had this shit. They, they, these fucking, so back, so I don't know if you're around, Alex, but back then they, uh, the Chinese stocks were running like crazy. And so these guys like Citron, uh, all those guys made a name for themselves showing these Chinese stocks. Because you know what, man? They went to China. They hired consulting companies in China to sit outside the fucking factory to count how many fucking trucks were going in and out of these companies. Because Chinese people, they have two books, okay? Uh, they have the real book, which is like the real numbers, and then they have the fake made-up shit that they show to the public. Um, and so these Chinese got cracked when these companies, like the short seller guys, went to China to actually start counting all these things they said. They went over there, they checked the factories out, they fucking pretended all this shit, they did undercover work. And so that's how they fucking busted all this shit. And, and it's crazy, it's the same shit's going on here in America, but no one talks about it. But dude, I don't wanna bust this shit either. I wanna make money off this shit. It's not my fucking responsibility to bust these markets. I'm not paid to be the regulator. You know, as a stock trader, we, we just have to take advantage of this shit, right, Alex? So yeah, exactly. that's what we do, man. That's awesome. That's a crazy story. And that, I know that's just the beginning of it all. I want to save some of these stories for next time, but I kind of want to talk about like some fun topics now. Like you remember last week when you went to UPS, you want to talk about that story? <laughs> so, so this whole podcast, I, I mean, we really don't have anything to talk about, but the podcast meant to be a day in the life of a normal day trader. This is what I fucking do, man. I wake up at four o'clock. I go to the bathroom. I brush my teeth. I take a dump. I ate a breakfast. I'm just a fucking normal guy, right? And so last week, that day was fucking fun, funny because so I made a, like four grand that day, four thousand bucks within like less than an hour. And I, so I and so I we we Alice and I bought one of the members um, a laptop because he helped us a lot. Okay, so shout out to I don't want to say the name, but shout out to whoever, right? He knows. So I bought this fucking, we bought this laptop at Costco and it was a 17 inch laptop. So the box was kind of long and weird shaped. So I'm like, I didn't know. So I was like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to splurge. Cause usually, man, I, I'm a very frugal guy. Frugal doesn't mean cheap. It's like, if I can save money, I'll fucking save money. Regardless of how much money I have in my pocket. Right. Um, so I went to the fucking UPS store. First, actually went, I went to the post office because I'm like, okay, I'm going to ship this shit but they didn't have a box for it. It was so long and weird. Then I went to the UPS store where they, they box it for you. And they're like, fuck, this box is too, too big. They charged me $140 just to box this shit and mail it. 150 bucks. I don't even know that like who's shipping. A moving, a moving box, like a giant fucking box, massive box, you know? So it's, it's fucking funny. So 
I'm like, fuck, I'm not gonna pay $150. So I decided to go Office Depot. So I've been driving around, at this point, I've been driving around two locations already. Office Depot is- So Bao calls location. me, right? Bao calls me, he's at the UPS store. He's like, yo, I'm at the store and they want, you know, uh, $100 to box it and they want $50 to ship it. And I'm like, 150, that seems like too much. At most, it should be like 50 bucks, you know, 20, 30 bucks to box it, maybe 20, 30 bucks. So, to, uh, yep, I was wondering it. why the fuck they charging me $150? Cause they told me, oh, it's a lot of packaging, all that. I don't believe it. I'm gonna fucking do it myself. So then I fucking go cross town to Office Depot. So now I'm already two hours deep into this fucking thing, right? To try to save money. And 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 remember, this is like I've already made four thousand dollars with the first first hour of trading, right? Uh, so here I am trying to save fucking fifty dollars. And so I go to Office Depot. I end up buying a giant ass fucking box. And it was like throwing a hot dog in the hallway, dude. This this <laughs> so fucking small. I needed to wrap this fucker up. It was, it was like having sex with a porn star, dude. <laughs> I had to, like, like double up on the condom, try to double up on the condom. I kept wrapping this shit in bubble wrap, popcorn, whatever. I finally stuffed the box. So the box would end up being huge. And I was like, motherfucker, it ain't fucking worth it. So after two and a half fucking hours or three hours, right, I finally finished taping the fucking box up. I was in the store for over half an hour. Fucking my back hurt. I was bending over, bubble wrapping. <laughs> I was walking around the store. So after almost three hours, dude, I finally finally mailed it. And yeah, I did save. How much? Did it, how much was the bill? The bill came out to be what? Like, like you save? Seven, yeah, saved you save. Yeah, you saved. I think it was like seventy bucks. But then right after, you went to go fill up your gas tank for everything. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's the fucking funny part, dude. So three hours of driving around and boxing and all this shit. It was like fucking to save seventy fucking dollars, but I felt vindicated. I was like, "Yeah, bitch, I fucking saved seventy. So now I wonder, now I understand why they were charging me so much. And then I was like, "Fuck!" Now I'm out of gas because I. So the the funny, stupid shit. This is how I am. I I fucking spent so much to try to save all that, and then I fucking like my gas was more than the fucking shit. I spent three hours. Half my tank was gone. <laughs> your and tank so, was gone. Your time was gone. Everything was gone. So the moral of the story, guys. This is something I have to get through my head. The moral of the story is this, you know what? Time is more valuable sometimes yeah. than just fucking money. The three hours that I could have done could have been used for so much more than try to save 70 bucks. In the end, I didn't save shit. I had fucking lost money. I actually just fucking did it and, and gone and done other things in my life. I'm fucking tired. My back hurts. I ran out of gas and all that shit. So, <laughs> so that's basically a day in the life. I mean, like that's Bao's day in life. I have a story too. Cause, uh, the Alex is the opposite. So I am yeah, ultra yeah. frugal and Alex is like, YOLO, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to buy a fucking $500 brick that says Supreme on it. Right? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that's the funny thing about me and Bao. We're so similar, but so different in like so many other ways. So like, for example, like Bao went to go save $50. He drove around town. He did this and that. But a funny story is this, I think it was this Saturday or this past Friday or something like that. Um, I was with my brother and my brother is dating this girl from uh, New York City. Uh, some like really, really wit, like rich, pretty girl, this and that. So he's like, yo, come to the city with me. Let's go get drinks. You know, we don't really hang out too much anymore. Like, let's just hang out together. And I think it was Friday or Saturday, whatever day it was. And I was like, yeah, dude, I miss you. I love you. Like, let's hang out. Let's do something. He's like, all right, before we do though, I have to go get a haircut in Soho. Uh, come with me so we could skip the traffic and I'm like haircut in Soho like you're kidding me right like so for Soho for people that don't know it's like a upper class area this is in New York City in New York City so I go and I'm like all right you know while we're there I mean rather than me sitting down and watching you get a haircut for an hour if I'm going to be there for an hour waiting anyway why don't I go get a haircut there too so we walk into this place right glass doors everywhere um Every single person working in there, men, women, and even the customers are good looking people. I felt very out of place. Uh, so we're walking in and Alan is getting his haircut, my brother. And I asked like the very nice lady at the desk and I said, Hey, like, you know, can I get a haircut too? Do you guys have time for me? My brother's getting a haircut today. Like if it's cool, like I'd love to do it. And they're like, yeah, sure. No problem. So before I walked in, I made the mistake of not asking Alan how much this haircut would be. <laughs> I said, how much could a haircut be? The most I paid right now, I pay $30 with tip for my haircut and beard. Uh, the, the most expensive place I went to before that was $70 in Hawaii because I just really needed a haircut. So I said, at most, it's probably going to be 70 bucks. It's probably not even going to be more than 50. So I go to the place and immediately when I walk in, someone 
comes out and takes my jacket. They hand me a robe. I put on a robe. I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice. <laughs> then I get introduced to this very beautiful blonde girl, Olivia, who then goes and washes my hair. So here I am in a robe being escorted by a beautiful woman to get my hair washed. We're talking about some bullshit. And then after I get my hair washed, I get escorted by her to a different guy, John, who then combs my hair, right? After I get combed, I then go to the barber, right? The barber sits me down. He says, what do you want? This and that. I tell him, whatever. I'm telling him how I like my hair cut done. We're talking about stuff. Um, and he told me that he used to work at a different barber shop. And I said, why'd you come here? Like, why you start working here? He's like, bro, the women here are so beautiful. I hit on every single one of them all day. He's like, I get into trouble sometimes, but it's all worth it. So we're talking, we're bullshitting midway through after he's done cutting the side of my hair. I go, my hair gets washed again. I come back, he does the top, it gets washed again. I come back, he does my beard and then they do like a final clean. So overall, it was like a very luxurious, beautiful experience. I go to the desk and I'm like, thank you, this was amazing. I'm like, how much do I owe? They're like, that's gonna be $110. And I'm like, well, that's not like, trip. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm like thinking to myself, I'm talking in Armenian to Alan, I'm like, bro, are you fucking kidding me, bro? Like, where, where the fuck did you bring me? Like, what are they, what's next? Like, am I going to get an iPhone or are they going to give me a pair of AirPods? Like what's going on? He's like, and then he's speaking to me in Armenian again. Uh, he's like, don't forget to tip them. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, how much should I tip him? You know, five bucks. He's like, no, bro, give him, 20, give him 20 bucks. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me, bro? So overall I went, I got this haircut that honestly, like as wonderful and as amazing as the experience was as beautiful as the people were there and as nice as they were, I could get fucking five haircuts at my Turkish guy down the street for that same price. But instead, the reason why Alan goes to that barbershop is because the guy cutting his hair is the guy that cuts Scott Disick's hair, who was like <laughs> one of the Kardashians or like those one of the Kardashians, like baby, baby daddy to one of the Kardashians. So because that guy cuts Alan's hair, Alan goes to him and goes to that barbershop. So now I know not to ever go to the fucking barbershop with Alan again because the guy's completely lost. Like I explained to Val, like this tattoo that I have here, over here, it looks like a prison tattoo, but that was a thousand dollars. And the reason why is because again, my brother fooled me into going to a celebrity tattoo artist. So maybe Val, maybe what I have to do is start hanging out less with my brother and start hanging out more with you. Because this Yo, is how old ridiculous. your brother? Is he like twenty two? Alan is 22. Yeah, Alan is 22. He is, he is the perfect guy that is falling for all the market. He's the guy that bought that freaking Supreme Brick, right? Yeah, he brought he bought the Supreme Brick. Uh, he has these pair of Red October Yeezys. Let me show you. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know if you know these, but these Red Octobers, you see it on the screen, Bob, these go for 10 to 20K, and he's never worn them, worn them once. Jeez. Oh, it's it's kind of oh, ugly, dude. bro. <laughs> dude. Dude. <laughs> it's funny, man. It's funny. So the dude. reason why I bring up the tattoo story is because Alan's, Alan's guy, his celebrity tattoo artist that did, you know, Kylie Jenner, Justin Bieber and shit like that, charged $1,000. I went to some guy on the street, like some normal guy for this tattoo, which means family in Armenian, and this was $65. So it's just two different worlds out there, man. It's two different worlds. You have, bro, bro I, I have the same haircut fucking story, but this happened when I was, dude, this was like 25 years ago when I was barely in college. I had no fucking money. So I decided like I was desperate for a haircut. Uh, I, I had a date with some girl. I was stuck in San Francisco and I was like, fuck, I'm going to go out in this haircut. How, how expensive can it be? Right. Remember this is 25 years ago. Um, dude, shit, you weren't even born, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was probably in my, uh, I was, uh, what's it called when you're, you're, my mom was pregnant. Yeah. You're in the womb. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the womb. <laughs> okay. So I walk in and of course, you know, like most of the hair cutters are like Europeans, right? And they're like blonde, tall, blonde girls. So I asked, yeah. how much is it? 15, 15, 15. So I'm thinking 15 bucks, not fucking bad. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm fucking down. Remember this was a day I, I, my hair cutter was $8 at that time. Eight dollars was what I paid for my haircut. So I'm like, I'll splurge. We're in San Francisco, fucking nice area. I'll splurge. I'll pay double, fifteen bucks. So I walk in exactly what they did. Right, they took my shit off. They put a nice fucking robe on me, and they like, would you like champagne? I'm like, <laughs> fucking free. I'm like, I look around. These women are like fucking iced out, nice bags, drinking champagne while getting a fucking haircut. Right. I'm like, fuck, give me all the fucking free champagne you can get. 
<laughs> so I'm thinking, so they're doing all this fucking shit to me. And as you know, Asian hair, you know, every ethnicity has a different type of hair. Like mine is harder or more coarse, right? So you have to cut it a certain style. And they use shears. Most of the guys that I pay $8 for, they use shears, right? It's like, it's like eh, the buzz cut, right? Uh, but this guy was using fucking scissors. Like, oh, no. Hold on. He is fucking... I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, yeah, we let you do things by hand. I was like, you're going to take fucking an hour. <laughs> and so in the end, when it, the bill came, it was like fucking 65 bucks, bro. And I'm just like about to... And remember, I, I'm like fucking... Back, back 25 years ago... Man, that thing was more than your haircut. So 65 bucks, it probably like inflation like three times now. It, it was like fucking $200 haircut. You wow. know what I'm saying? And so I learned really quickly to always figure out, it's like, well, it's, dude, it's like you always have to fucking ask what you get yourself into, but, but just be smart, right, man? When you sit down, just fucking be smart. <laughs> like, you know, you know what you're getting yourself into. It's like, and Better, like more money doesn't necessarily mean better, man. You know, it's like that's the thing. I, I realized longer in life is like, so I'm, I'm the complete opposite. Somewhere in the middle, Alice is me and you is where we should be the balance. I'm the kind of guy that likes to go fucking buying clearance shit and I end up buying 10 of these clearance shirts, which I never wear. And I end up wearing one shirt I like over and over. So now buy one shit that you like to wear and you fucking, I know it's not being too cheap. So I'm too frugal and you're too extravagant. And so somewhere in the middle is the fucking bottom line, dude. So exactly, exactly. So, I mean, this is, again, this is like a day in the life of like what me and Bao do. You this know, is what trade. fucking day traders do, man. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, fuck. I mean, the story of like that store is a perfect example. Fucking made $4,000 in fucking less than an hour. And here I'm trying to save fucking $70. How stupid is that? I could have stuck around, did some other shit. And whereas Alex, on the other hand, is like fucking making rain. <laughs> I was like, I was like, Bow, while you're at UPS, just pay the money and walk away. You're gonna have to drive as well. But like that's the thing too. There has to be a middle ground as well. It can't just be always pay the top price or do it yourself. There has to be somewhere in the middle. And maybe I, I, I do it because I think I do it to remind myself how lucky and blessed I am, Alex. Of course I can walk in and buy any fucking shit. Yeah. Of course I can do that. Alex told me too, Bow just fucking paid 150 bucks. Remember you told me? Yeah. And, 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 and this is the valuable lesson that I came out of it. It was like, dude, it was so awesome to be able to, to go at 11 o'clock in the morning at noon and be a normal guy. I fucking drove around. I dressed like this. No one knew what I did. I am boxing this shit at Office Depot. I am literally walking around the store, <laughs> finding tape, finding all the shit. I'm fucking making the box right at Office Depot, dude. And at the end, I'm like, fuck, it felt great. It felt like, fuck, what an accomplishment. It made me value and appreciate what I do for a living, right? We are so blessed, Alex, man, where we can sit here and click a fucking button and make more in one hour than most people make a month on, you know, wearing our underwear. And so sometimes when you, when you are that privileged, you forget. And so that's why you fuck up your trading because you're like, oh, it's easy. It's easy. And it's like nothing is easy. And so you have to remain humble. And I think I do it. At, and I'm telling you, dude, it was the best feeling of my life. I drove around all day. It fucking felt great. It, yeah, it, made it reminds me. you too that like shit, you're, it's 11 a.m. your time. Most people are at work or they're getting lunch or they're doing whatever. But not only are you done with your work day, you are now doing something for fun or just doing something because you have the time. Most people wish they had the time to drive around, even go get Starbucks or get Chipotle or whatever it is in the afternoon, but they have to work. That scenario reminds you that shit. I am so lucky that I sit down and I am done trading before people even come home from work. You know, that's, that's the attitude that I've always had since I was little, you know, we don't realize how blessed we are. Like, like I grew up in Vietnam. So when I visit Vietnam, I'm like, Holy crap, dude. It's like, I've, I should never, ever complain about my life ever again. You know what I'm saying? I would gladly drive for three hours to save 70 bucks because that's a week of pay for most of the people in Asia. Yeah. Their average income is $300 a fucking month. I talked to a masseuse. The masseuse was making two to 300 bucks. And I go, oh, so do you get the weekends off? She goes, yeah, I get one weekend off a month. I'm not joking. It's so fucking sad. They wow. come from the village somewhere. And we, we, we say, fuck, man, we work too hard. Uh, we, we get two days off a week. But they get one weekend off a month. Wow. 
I'm like, dude, it's, it's perspective. So, it's so fucking crazy. And they're making $300, man. And so those are the type of people when I go tipping, I tip those. So when I go to clubs and I throw away stupid money, you know who I tip? I tip the guy in the bathroom. I don't tip those chicks. Those chicks are already rich. <laughs> those chicks are rich. And so, cause the, the, the clubs, the, it comes with the tip, but these guys are trying to press the hot chicks that they're trying to over tip. And these hot chicks got all these rich guys. So you're not going to fucking lay any of these hot, rich, uh, these chicks, dude. They're richer than you. <laughs> the chicks at the fucking clubs. I work at the clubs. They're richer than you. So save your fucking money. If you want to tip someone, you know why I tip? I tip the bouncer because at the end of the day, the bouncer is the guy that's going to fucking protect you when the fights happen and all this shit. So I, the first thing I do is I come and I tip the bouncer. The bouncer is going to fucking protect me. Anything that happens. And the best thing is, the bouncer would bring me chicks. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, for, why am I spending and tipping the, 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 the chick, which I can never get the number from, which is the hostess, you know what I'm saying? When I can just give fucking the bouncer, who's going to save my life and get me girls. So those are the things in life that, you know what, man, you have to think about different perspective. And that has actually helped me a lot, right? It helped me to not, I'm still greedy and, you know, sometimes I get arrogant and stuff, but it keeps me humble. And I think that helps me with trading. That's why we're doing the podcast. We want everybody to realize that this is the normal day in the life of a fucking trader, dude. This is, I mean, there was a point in my life where I made knock on wood so much money I couldn't fucking spend. And it was the most miserable experience. When you have like no reason to actually wake up besides money, it's fucking, it's a miserable feeling, Alex. I mean, I'm not joking. It was, dude, there, there was a span of a few years I was making like Fucking like half a million every month, dude. It was fucking crazy. It, is a statute over? I hear a statute. But it was fucking, it was insane. No one would fucking believe it. And people would think that you need to make a shitload of money every day. No, dude, just being consistent. I was so consistent where it added up. $200 a day, guys, is, is 50000 a year. That's, that's putting shit in perspective. $200 a day is $50,000 a year. I mean, yeah. That's, that's what it is, man. It doesn't take much. So to think, to make a million a year, guys, is 4,000. That's it, 4,000 a day. It's not that's it, but, but that puts in perspective. If you think, so when, when you think about a million dollar uh, income, you're like, oh, wow, you must be making 10, 20, $50,000 a day. No, dude, 4,000 consistently averaged a day makes you a million bucks a year. That's, that's what it takes. And so I had that mindset a long time ago. And so that's, that's why I was able to just kind of chug along. Whereas I had other friends who were swinging up and down 30, 50,000. Same thing you, you, you could be the testament to that, right? Alex, you used to swing up and down 30,000. Yeah, man, even more, even more. It was, it was up 50,000 Monday, minus 20,000 Tuesday, up 30,000 Wednesday, minus 80,000 Thursday or whatever it is. And it yielded to, let's say a $15,000 week or whatever it was. But now if I'm just trading less, I'm, I'm making $3,000 a day. I'm still yielding to that $15,000 a week with less stress and more happiness in my life. Yeah, because I remember what you said, man. You're like, so the, the evolution of your trading was, I think the turning point was when I, when, well, you started using hard stops, which is good. So the hard stops stopped you from fucking blowing up. But you were always stopping out. And for when you stopped out, it was like always $30,000 loss, right? It was 15,030. So I said, why the fuck do you always have to take your max loss? Because you were getting into, because you're like, so you're very proud of taking the, the hard stops. But then you didn't realize that, fuck, dude, you didn't, most of those losses were preventable. So now what I love about your trading, Alex, is you, you are patient. You are not trading every single stock that moved. You, you are not always thinking about like, like being proud that you're fucking taking these losses. It's, I mean, you don't have to take the loss. That's the thing. And you're sizing accordingly because you used to size the same giant size for every setup. And that's correct. Wrong. Correct. Yep. So talk about that. I think that, that might help people too, man. It's about sizing is very important. Talk about your rule. I, I love your sizing rule, man. Yeah. So something, again, you have to make mistakes before you learn what to do right. So I had to keep making those mistakes until something clicked in my head and how do I fix it? So I mean, I created something called the 30% rule. So the way it works for me is if the stock is on the front side of the move, if the stock is above VWAP, if the stock is trending up, 
I'm only allowed to use 30% of my max size on the setup. So for example, if my max size is a thousand shares, I'm only allowed to use 300 shares while the stock is going up because when the stock does turn, when backside is in, when the confirmation is in, then that gives me the ability to size them more. And if I am wrong with 30% of my size on the front side, it is much easier to take a loss on small size than it is to take a loss with uh, larger size. So that's something that you know we've been talking to the members about. That's something that's been helping James's trading a lot. And the sooner that people implement that into their trading, the sooner they'll see better results. Yep. So we want to end the podcast by, by, by saying this. Um, what did you do this weekend, Alex? A day in the life. What did you do this weekend? Um, what was this weekend? Let me think. Uh, it, I was actually sick. The rainstorm of the century. <laughs> I was actually sick this weekend. So I was actually, so for example, uh, my friends went out on Saturday night. Uh, they went to New York City. Uh, my friend Pete has an apartment there. So they all went there. I kind of just stayed home and I was actually, uh, believe it or not, I was working on some uh, advertising stuff for MIC, like some marketing stuff. But other than that, I mean, I was just sick in bed watching TV and answering questions all day. Nothing, nothing really glamorous this week. What about you? So we, yeah, we, we had a little house party for one of our family members. It was her birthday. Yeah, bro. I saw five bottles of uh, Casa Azul. <laughs> I saw eight bottles of Don Julio. Like I saw everything, bro. What kind of party are you guys throwing? What kind of pizza party was that? Yeah. So this, so this, this is, this is, I mean, this is what normal thing is. We don't, I mean, it's not popping bottles at clubs. It's basically, man, it doesn't take much money to change your life. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. So I, I splurge by buying the top liquor. I like, we spent like four to $500 on liquor to throw the party, but in, tra- in retrospect, right. That sounds like a lot of money, but if you can just change and supplement your income guys by hundred dollars, two hundred dollars a day and on top of your job, dude, $500 is a fucking life changing. You don't have to waste it on it. But the thing is we waste it on ourselves. We're not showing off. We're not doing this. So I think I like to show with this podcast to let everybody know what a normal fucking trader does. Like a real successful guy that makes money and all this shit is not popping bottles and not none of this shit, man. And that's, I think that is the fallacy that makes people lose. People think that that's the lifestyle. And so, you know, like look at Alex, man, he's a simple, normal guy. And that's what it is. He's humble. The key is to stay humble. And, and you know what, man, let other people do the talking for you. And that's what it is, man. You, you know, every time I get, and same thing with um, every member I talk to, to uh, the biggest losses always come from having a great streak where you get arrogant and you break your rules and you think you can do no harm. And then boom, the mother losses come, right? And you forget. And so, so these activities that we do on the weekends, guys, helps us a lot. So guys out there, guys, sure. There's a lot of guys that make money and pop balls, but those guys are in fucking prison. <laughs> I know a lot of those guys. <laughs> um, no, that's great though. I think what we should do is maybe at the end of the podcast, every time we should talk about what we did over the weekend, just to get some perspective on you know, what our real life is about. But I mean, I guess the last thing I want to do before we end this is uh, I want to say that uh, this is our first podcast. So if you guys could leave us a review or leave us a comment or leave us feedback, uh, what you thought of it or how you think we could improve or just any general, like any general feedback, just so that we know what we're doing and if we're on the right track. What what I want to do for the next podcast, Alex, is to talk about how you got to where you got and how I got to where I got so that maybe it'll inspire and motivate people on how you do it. Yep. Because me, Alex and I are very typical, normal guys that resembles all of you. Yeah. I mean, I used to work at Starbucks, bro. I, I, I never, I'll never forget working at Starbucks. Every single time I walk in there, I always remember because at Starbucks, what they did is before, like while you're in the process of like working there and being hired, they make you try every single drink that they have just in case a customer asks, what does this taste like? You could tell them in detail what it tastes like. So I still remember what everything tastes like. I still remember how to make everything. So just <laughs> stories like that, man. Yep. So I think that that'll be the next good one. Cause um, I, I mean, we, we, we do this to, to open the curtain, to review the veil, right? To move up the veil and, and fucking show you what the reality of trading is a fucking lonely existence. Why are we doing this podcast? Because fuck man, we want to reach out and let people know because man, I've never been happier since I started MIC. It's not about the money, none of this shit. It's the fact that finally meet normal people because I was always thinking 
you have to make money. You have to be the best. You have to do all this to be happy. And that's not the fucking reality of it, dude. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's a good thing that we're doing this because the next, the next episode, guys, we're going to talk about how Alex did it, the roadmap and all this stuff. Because to be honest, man, we are not Ivy League guys. We are the people that we never thought would be fucking doing this shit successfully, right? Marginalized, like Alex working at Starbucks. We are fully going young, all this stuff. Man. We had a lot of adversity. We are just one of you guys. And so if, if we can help one of you guys get to where we are and in, re- in turn you help someone else, I call it paid for it. That's fucking phenomenal, man. So that's, I think that would be the next good topic. And then from then, then on out, leave us a message and let us know. Maybe we'll bring you on a podcast, right? We'll yeah, bring that'd one be of great. the members on. That'd be cool. Um, last thing before I end it is that if you are not an MIC member, we have a free two-hour course just to kind of introduce you into trading in the trading world. Uh, you could reserve your spot at myinvestingclub.co. That's yep. it. More, Thanks, more stories next time, guys. This is just the beginning. Thanks for tuning in.